as far as role models, um, I think, you know, it's obviously some of the, the obvious role models. I think Edison was certainly a role model, um, pro probably one of the biggest role models. Um, Did you study Edison's <coughs> life? Or? Yeah, I read books about him, absolutely. Um, and, um, and it's an interesting contrast, like Edison versus Tesla, because interesting, you know, the, the car company is called Tesla. Um, and the reason it's called Tesla is because we use an AC induction motor, which is an architecture that Tesla developed. Um, and the guy probably deserves a little more play than he gets in current society. Um, but on balance, I'm a bigger fan of Edison than Tesla, um, because Edison brought his stuff to market and made those inventions accessible to the world, whereas Tesla did, didn't really do that. Um, so uh, that's so he'd, he'd certainly be a big one. Um. There's no way Norway is actually going to ban regular cars seven years from now. But they're going to continue to throw money at millionaire posers and billionaire schemes. Here's Elon Musk, the president of Tesla, perhaps the most subsidized company in the United States. They make extremely expensive cars that are only affordable because of billions of dollars in handouts, subsidies, both directly to the company and also to customers. Musk would be out of business. Tesla would be out of business in a month without government intervention. So naturally, he was thrilled with his news from Norway. Here he wrote, just heard that Norway will ban new sales of fuel cars in 2025. What a, an amazingly awesome country. You guys rock. You guys rock, he wrote that. That's how virtue signaling politicians like to be received, not that sound policy, that sound economics, but you guys are cool. You guys rock. That's what posers are looking for. They're looking for buzz. You guys are the best. You know, most automakers try to win over their customers to choose them voluntarily. That's what marketing's about. Elon Musk and Tesla is perfectly fine having the government ban his competitors to force customers to buy his overpriced cars with the teeny tiny driving distance. Thanks for watching. Click here to never miss a Rebel update. Want even more of the Rebel? Well, click here to become a premium member. They're exotic, they're surreal. They just look like nothing else on the road. So much engineering time, effort, and hours went into creating these masterpieces. But there's also a flip side. Tesla's stance on rebuilding vehicles is only they should be able to do it. Now, I would say I'm the first person to bring a Tesla that's completely dead to running and driving, almost showroom floor quality, independently by themselves. At this point, I would consider myself the Dr. Frankenstein of Teslas. People need to know more about the products they own. If you own something, if you purchase something free and clear, then you should be able to fix it yourself. I don't want people to think that they're too small to have a major company make changes. Don't feel that you're not being heard. You do have a voice. My name is Rich, and uh, I run a YouTube channel called Rich Rebuilds. I also go by Uncle Rich, uh, Car Guru. You're probably asking yourself, Car Guru, what are you doing in that sweet, sweet race car bed? Well, you think my life is all fun and games? Here's some of the things you have to deal with when you hobble together two broken Teslas to make one working Tesla. This car's been sitting for so long, you just don't know what's gonna happen. I think if someone would've watched the channel, they'd probably describe me as a DIY enthusiast to the extreme. 
slash Tesla Vigilante, honestly. <laughs> That's what they probably say. That MTU screen doesn't look so clean. Uh, it doesn't? Sorry, I'm fix that right now. We may hear some clicks. We may hear some buzzing. The car may explode. I don't know what's gonna happen, so. No freaking way. The door handle's just extended. Oh, Jesus. Oh my God. This car's been sitting for over a year. I want people to have their cars work. I want people to enjoy them. I'm just trying to help. I may not come across that way sometimes, but you know, there's a reason why I've owned 10 myself personally. There's a reason why I physically touched and helped people build over a hundred cars already. Uh-oh. Oh. First time it's ever happened. But that's all right. Tesla's the gatekeeper to us repairing our own goods because they want control over Tesla fixing the cars. They want control over Tesla selling you the parts. They just want everything under their control. Tesla service, how may I help you? Hey, how you doing today? Um, I have a P85. I need those little lug nut covers. What do you need those? What, why? Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, hold, hold on one second, hold on. <laughs> one of the things I enjoy is calling them out on their mistakes. You think Tesla's out here playing games? Tesla wants answers. Oh, hello, sorry, sorry about that. You still there? Uh, yeah. I think a fundamental consumer right is your ability to fix whatever you rightfully own. The fact that people don't have another alternative but to go into the manufacturer, that's a huge, huge issue. There's a lot of gray area as to what you actually own with, with these cars because in order for the major functions of the car to work, they have to talk to Tesla. I live in Massachusetts, and in Massachusetts, they have a Right to Repair Act. It, it does protect what I do. It makes it easier for me to get the tools that I need. But the language is very interesting. The language states that you have to have the same tools available that the dealers do to fix their cars. But guess what? Tesla doesn't have dealerships. That's a loophole right there. All right. So uh, this is my uh, basement full of Tesla parts. These are the, all of the parts that are required to uh, put a Tesla back together effectively. These uh, right here, I have all the battery modules that go in the battery pack. I have the, uh, the coolant pumps that are here. I have uh, a few MCUs, which is the media control units, the main master screen of the car. But these are the things that you have to do to uh, keep a Tesla on the road, you know, to have a, an inventory of spare parts so that you don't run out of stuff when you need it the most. I mean, it really is a gold mine because you can't find a lot of these, a lot of these parts uh, uh, back at Tesla. I get my parts from other cars. So what I have to do is I have to purchase other wrecked vehicles, take the parts I need from those, and then harvest those parts for the cars that I need parts for. In terms of being tricky, it's extremely tricky because if you need a specific part, you have to hope and pray that the car that you're taking the parts from has it. What I'm doing right now, fixing these cars, you know, under the radar from Tesla, is setting myself up for some big legal problems in the future, potentially. But because I think the cars are so great and I want to help people in that sense, I just think it's just something that I have to do. I have this part right here. And this is the visor that was in a Model S that actually was severely burned. You can see the burn marks on top of this. And, you know, to the untrained eye, you could probably just throw this part away. What's the point? It's burned. But if someone needs the spring that actuates the, the, the hinge for the visor, or if someone even needs this part right here, this could be recycled. You know, you shouldn't just throw it away as is. A lot of these things are still usable, like these hooks right here. This could probably be cleaned up really nice and put in another visor piece. We live in a, a day and age where people just throw things away. There's plenty of benefits to fixing your own cars. You know, it's less waste, eco-friendly, creates jobs, eases pressure off the manufacturer. It just, it just makes sense all in. So I figure if I could, you know, do something to contribute, help bring them back on the road, give them new life, I think it's a win-win for everyone. So a while back, a friend of mine said that he got a job at Tesla and he was going to bring one by. 
And we took a ride in it. I said to myself, I could see myself wanting one of these things for sure. About a year after that, I purchased my first Model S that was in a flood, and I started working on it. I spent $14,000 on a car that didn't run or drive and showed no signs of light. I had no support from the manufacturer. I was dead in the water. So I thought about it and I said to myself, I'm already in $14,000, let's just go all in. So I actually ended up purchasing another car that wasn't in a flood. Uh, I brought it home. I had two Teslas side by side in, in each garage bay. And over the course of, you know, several months, I slowly transplanted electronics from one car to the other. And it was just, I, I couldn't believe it. Slowly people started saying, maybe he's onto something here. Maybe he's not that crazy after all. Maybe this can be done. So today we're gonna check this burnt Tesla Model S out. Uh, this Tesla Model S was uh, hit in the front by another car. The other car caught fire. And as a result, the front of this car burned as well. When I saw this car online for the first time, my eyes just lit up. I mean, the front end was completely toast. Uh, everything was everywhere. The wheel was actually in the back and it was completely undrivable. But there were a couple pictures that I saw the interior, the back seats were still good. So I knew the second I saw this one, I had to buy it. Even though it seems like, you know, it's not much to look at and there's literally trees growing inside of it. Um, this is still worth a lot because for someone that's been rear-ended, instead of waiting, you know, four to six months for parts from Tesla, you know, they could just have the back half of this car, bring it to a body shop, and have oven running in a couple weeks. So many engineering hours have gone into making these, why throw it away when I could just take parts from this one and help someone in need? Seeing an abandoned car like that, having it sit in the field abandoned, being covered by snow and ice and dirt and rocks and it almost hurts in a way. It's technology is my thing. So seeing something like that is just, it hurts almost. If the mission and the motto is, is sustainability, then, um, you know, a car like this could sit in this state of the insurance lot for years before it gets picked up. My idea is to actually cut the front half of the car, remove some plastics, recycle the aluminum, and then I'll use the back half for a car that was rear-ended that needs fixing. It's aluminum, so it's not that hard to cut. So I'd probably get a Sawzall and I'd start about right here. I'd do it myself, yeah. I'd do it myself. So this is the storage area I keep a lot of my parts in. Uh, I have a rear seat cushion from a Tesla that's been sitting here, kind of getting mold all over it. There's just parts there's parts everywhere. I think I am obsessed. I didn't even think about that. I think I am. This is a lot of shit. I can't throw anything away until the project is done. And the problem with me is the project's never done. It definitely goes against Tesla's mission statement. But if there's an issue with one of their Teslas, and if only they can fix it, and no one else can, it sits in a field for years. How is that sustainable? Tesla service, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thanks. I have a uh, 2012 uh, Model S and it's giving me an issue charging. Uh, I've narrowed it down to one of the chargers under the rear seat. Uh, how much do those go for? Can I have your VIN number? Oh, sorry about that, sure. My VIN number is uh, five, um, we actually can't sell you any parts for that car either. It's on our restricted bin list. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, no parts at all? Unfortunately not, sir. I've expressed my frustrations to Tesla, mostly over the phone, but I've expressed a lot of my views and a lot of the things I've gone through on my, my personal channel. People at Tesla, they do notice the channel and they, they do they do know. Hey guys, it's your boy Rich here. And a buddy of mine that's also into the Tesla rebuild game, he recently got a letter in the mail from Tesla saying that there was an airbag recall. There was an issue a while back where, I mean, there was a recall for airbags and Tesla just refused to replace airbags on cars that they felt that they shouldn't support. So I made a video saying, what do you guys think? This doesn't seem right to me. Let me know what you guys think about this one in the comment section. Should Tesla be allowed to determine which cars it does and does not service? Or 
should they abide by the NHTSA's rules and make sure that all cars are repaired free of charge. And three weeks later, Tesla called my friend up and said, hey, come back in for an appointment. It's going to be great. Let's get that airbag all set for you. They won't make it easy, but eventually they're going to have to make it so that they help people or, or third-party repair shops build their vehicles. The project that I'm working on right now, it was in a flood. So that motor and that battery, they're just toast. So I have to get a trailer and pick up the motor and battery from a car that was in a rollover to transplant into the flooded car. Looking at the front of this battery, uh, it looks like uh, in the crash, the top case may have popped off slightly. It looks like some water got into the battery. Not feeling great right now. I probably have to pop that cover off and uh, see how much, if any, water's in there. I think that, that there's a quiet revolution starting. It's getting louder and louder, for sure. Now that people have various platforms to state their cases and make their voices known, there's definitely revolution coming. So uh, right now we're at Advanced Technologies in Gloucester, Mass. Uh, we're at my buddy Lee's shop, and uh, he's been helping me out a lot with uh, a lot of the uh, heavy lifting of the battery packs and the motors themselves. He actually saw me in the channel and he's like, hey, you know what? Like, I like what you're doing. I think it's really cool. Like, I want to help you out. So he's actually letting me uh, keep my car here, as well as help me work on it, and, you know, and give me access to all of his tools. So it's uh, pretty cool. When working on these cars, there's a lot of really interesting things that could happen sometimes, things you're just not ready for. Um, when I was taking out the battery pack, I discovered an actual crack in the side of the battery pack. And uh, we're going to check that crack out right now. So we're going to see, we're going to pop off the top cover. and we're gonna see if there's anything we could do to save that. What I do is extremely dangerous. It's very intimidating. Working with, you know, a high voltage battery pack has enough power to, to power a house for days or to just kill you within seconds. So I think when I opened my first battery pack, I had my lineman gloves on, I had like a full body suit. I was like, I'm gonna go in there in the deep blue yonder. And now I'm just like, nah, it is what it is. You know, I'll lick the terminals, nah, whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's your life, not mine. It's coming up. So this is what a Tesla Model S battery module looks like. And there's 16 of these. Each has its own individual section that it kind of lives in, isolated and firewalled from the next one. What I want to do now is I want to actually test the voltage that I'm seeing on, on these two bricks to see if they're still good. Give a voltmeter, Lee. Yeah, sorry. Huh? I just wanna get a... Oh, shit. <laughs> All yours? Thank you. All right, so we're getting 23 volts out of this one, which is good. Yeah, 23, 63. Each battery brick is uh, about 24 volts. So the fact that it's that high is definitely a good sign. It looks like those bricks are good. So I feel as if these two modules are good, then I feel safe saying that the rest of them are good as well. You know what, Lee? I'm going to put the cover back on and then just kind of let loosely tighten it. And then maybe we can start the, uh, the motor itself. All right. As an individual, Rich is uh, really steering the, the front line for uh, the backyard mechanic kind of thing, but really learning every inch of Tesla. Other companies can do it, but individuals taking on this task, it's a huge undertaking. Tesla has an image to keep up as a cutting edge auto manufacturer. And if you do fix your own car and something happens and another Tesla gets into an accident, it's gonna make national news. They don't wanna see that. I am completely sympathetic with their concerns. It's their brand. I totally get it. But it's not gonna stop me. 
that's not a reason why someone shouldn't do it. Worst case scenario, Tesla reaches out to me and says, you know, sent me a cease and desist. Like, stop doing what you're doing. Stop your YouTube channel. Stop doing close-ups of the inside electronics and motors and how they work. They could, they could say that. I'll, I'd still do it. Even though it's not the intention, I see myself opening up my own Tesla repair shop. They won't let that happen. But I'd like to do that. I'd like to help people. This is uncharted territory. This, this is cutting edge. This is the future.